Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, Policy Exchange, and welcome to um, the announcement of the shortlist for the Wilson uh, Economics Prize. Um, it's been uh, a huge pleasure for us at Policy Exchange to be an acting as the secretary of this amazing uh, prize. When it was initially announced, um, it experienced a degree of trepidation because for the first month we were sitting there having announced this huge prize and no entries were coming in. We were very worried we didn't get anything serious. And then slowly the trickle of entries that were coming in turned into a bit of a torrent, and then the torrent turned into a huge flood. Uh, and before we knew it, we had uh, 425 entrants, and we had the exact opposite of them. We had a huge amount of amazing material that we had to sift through. Um, the entries that we have received are an amazing, diverse uh, bunch in lots of different ways. Firstly, we have entries from all over uh, the world. We have entries from pretty much every EU member state, uh, from the US, Japan, China, uh, India, all over the world. And we also have an incredible diversity of types of uh, entrants as well. We have people from big financial institutions, teams from economics consultancies, university academics, uh, think tanks, policy makers, all kinds of people. Applying. And also a huge variety of different ways of approaching the problem. So some people are concentrating on particular aspects, perhaps avoiding capital flights, some people focusing on uh, international contracts and international law implications. So many entries looking at just one country leaving, some of them looking at the whole um, euro breaking up. Uh, and some of them in fact raising lots of questions that uh, even I wasn't aware of at the start of the process. Um, even I was not aware of it. Um, there is a, a, a famous uh, former US Defense Secretary who is famous for his distinction between known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I feel now we know more of the unknown, uh, more of the unknown unknowns have been turned at least into uh, known unknowns. And in fact, quite a few of the questions have, I think, been quite well addressed. There's an interesting um, uh, big feature in the FT today saying the euro is a time bomb that no one can um, defuse. But actually, I, I, my question actually from reading the amazing goals of entries that we've had for this prize is that uh, while it is not an easy problem to solve, it's not an impossible one uh, either. So in, in a moment I'll hand over to Simon uh, to say a bit more about the prize and then on to Derek to announce the shortlist. Um, but just before I do that, there's a few people I'd like to, to thank. Um, I firstly would like to thank um, our economics team here, and Andrew Lillico, who have been involved in the epic sifting of all these entries. So, uh, I worked up the other day if we printed them all out and laid them end to end, it would stretch from here to the bridge. So there's a huge amount of material and they've done an amazing job of sifting all that down for um, the judges to a short list to make their decisions from. I'd like um, uh, to thank Derek for chairing and the judges and for Simon for making it possible in the first place really. Um, uh, I mean we would like to believe that some of these problems might just go away but um, they probably won't because now we're going through a sort of lull in the euro crisis, the rolling euro crisis, um, but you know, at the end of this month or the start of the next we'll have the Greek elections and all these things will probably be back on the agenda. So it's good to have important people all over the world thinking about these uh, difficult and important problems. And so lastly but not least, I'd like to thank absolutely everybody who has taken part in this. It's, uh, unfortunately not everybody can be shortlisted. Um, but we have, I think, got some uh, really, really impressive answers that have been generated as a result of this prize. We said at the very start of the process that uh, when you have a big problem, you need a big prize to get people thinking about it. And that's uh, exactly how this prize has actually worked out in practice. So thank you to everyone who ate it. I'm going to, to hand over to Simon now to say a little bit about why this prize is still relevant and what we were hoping to achieve with it. So thank you, Simon. <coughs> Thanks for the good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming, and I think a big thank you to the five shortlisted winners, or you know, what do you call the shortlist um, contenders uh, for the main prize. Um, I've read all of your entries, and uh, I've been fantastically impressed. I, I, the, the aim of this prize has always been to build intellectual capital. Um, it's amazing how many people have talked to me about this prize and said, well, you must be very pleased with the amount of publicity you're getting. Actually, that, the point of this was not to get publicity. The point of this was to get an answer to a problem that I believe at some point Europe is going to have to face. Um, and from reading the, the entries, what has become clear to me is really there, there are two problems here. The first is a problem of splitting a currency, and that's been done many times before. But one of the entries in particular goes into this in great detail. And actually, splitting currencies is not terribly difficult. What complicated, but you know, not impossible. What is 
interesting and difficult about this currency split, where it's happened, is that it would inevitably lead to devaluation of a large number of the currencies that we have um, particularly the Southern European countries, and that, in effect, would cause default. And that gives, with it, not only the prospect of, of limited default, it also gives the prospect on the upside of return to competitiveness in those countries. But um, because there is this implicit threat of default, there's also the whole issue of capital flight and how do you control capital flow, flows in the run-up to any breakup. And uh, you know, I think these papers between them have gone a long way to answer those problems. I still think there's more work to do and it'll be very exciting to see what emerges over the next three months. Um, but one thing I'm absolutely convinced of is that at some point an answer is going to be necessary. And the analogy that always springs to mind with the Euro is a, a runaway train. You know, uh, you probably in some, some 1950s films, you get those runaway trains, like there's some steep couple from the cabin, starts slowly rolling down the hill and gathers more and more speed until it reaches that rickety old bridge at the end. Um, and the, the thing about the Euro is that you know, at any point, jumping is going to be painful. And I think that's why there's so much reluctance to even talk about the possibility. But at the same time, the faster this thing moves, the more entrenched it becomes, the more likely, and, uh, the more likely it is to be extremely painful, the more problematic it becomes. So the sooner we come up, the world's thinkers come up with a clear, precise, um, relatively painless way of dealing with the problem, um, the better it will be for Europe and all those involved. Um, thanks very much for your time, Tony. I'm now going to hand over to the chairman of the judging uh, panel. You'll be pleased that I haven't actually done the judging for this. I've employed, not employed, but we've um, got the service of proper, clever economists to look at it, and um, Derek is their leader, so he will organise you. Thank you. Not so long ago, uh, the former chairman or the head of the IMF, Mr. Strauss Kahn, compared uh, economic money reunion to marriage. Uh, I'm not sure whether this says more. Mr. Strauss Kahn, the of marriage, union. But presumably, in some, in some way, it is uh, implied that the thing would hold, uh, hold together one way or another, whatever happened. Uh, that obviously is not the logic behind uh, the Wilson question. Uh, though deliberately didn't uh, make any suggestions of whether a country leaving the euro was a good or a bad idea, just assumed that the country had to had to had to leave and ask for responses on that, on that basis. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate the, the thanks um, uh, to everybody who wrote in. Uh, I mean, as everybody said, that there, there have been uh, a tremendously uh, good response, a very high quality. I mean, I know every competition, everybody always says that, uh, and to be honest, you know. There have been some entrants who were not up to speed, um, but by and large uh, the entrants were, were, were very, very, uh, very good indeed. And um, the judges, need to say, had a, a very difficult decision to make. I, I would just emphasise the point, which is perhaps fairly obvious, that when the judges considered the uh, couple of dozen um, papers that uh, have been put forward uh, provisionally by Policy Exchange and myself, of course, the judges did not have the names, we simply had numbers. So uh, that, that is, uh, this is the first time the, the names, so to speak, have been uh, come out. Uh, I don't think it's, um, uh, as, as, as Neil said, um, in broad terms, I suppose there were two types. One that dealt uh, eventually, one that dealt with the kind of macroeconomic or the economic issues, and those that focused on some of the other more nitty-gritty things like contracts and law and, and so on and so forth. And I don't think it's disclosing state secrets. Uh, to say that the judges were very taken, in particular, with one uh, of each of these two groups. The other three had a, also had a great deal of supporters as, as, as well. And I think, uh, as Neil says, that because the subjects that had to be addressed were so diverse, and inevitably some entrants put more emphasis on, on, on some roles than others, that's one of the reasons why we are having this, if you like, second stage when uh, uh, the entrance, uh, the five today, will be asked to go back and respond to the views of, uh, of, the, of the judges to try and um, uh, come up with a slightly revised version for the final, the final uh, uh, prize on uh, July the 5th. 
Uh, now, the shortlist um, uh, is going to be an, an announced, I mean, as you know, probably Rachel wouldn't be here. Uh, in alphabetical order, I had to, had to say, there was not in any area of priority. And I'm going to say a few words, very few words, uh, about each of them. Uh, and then there's the bad news for the entrance. They have to come up, shake my hands, um, get a little award which looks remarkably like a brick. I, was, I actually suggested we should have a, um, a sterling sign, but this is not, uh, not, not, a, not a serious kind of suggestion. Uh, and then if they would, we'll, we'll, we'll take the award then, if they will, we'll sit uh, and sit down here and uh, then have a very brief Q&A uh, Q question uh, after the, afterwards. Now the first, alphabetically, is uh, Roger Google and his team, and he seems to call most of them along presumably on the best Labour Party position, I think there's going to be a block vote uh, <laughs> later, later on. Uh, and this, uh, not surprisingly, people who are familiar with, uh, with Roger's work, was, was a, a, a very, very clear uh, account of the main alternatives. Uh, and the uh, paper provided a very practical guide to uh, the issues surrounding exit. Um, and um, uh, among other things, had a very excellent knowledge of analogous situation uh, elsewhere. The paper was, is divided into several sections. The first sets out into intellectual framework. Uh, these of the next section dealt with different ways of going to be broken up. And subsequent sections dealt with the political practicalities, the pros and cons of, uh, of uh, uh, capital controls, uh, contract law, and, and, and all the rest of it. And I think the thing that struck me about this was that um, it recognised that the central problem confronting the euro is the loss of competitiveness. Um, this may seem like everybody here is blindingly obvious, uh, but most of the commentariat uh, seem to still think that debts and deficits are the main cause rather than symptoms. And Roger has, and his colleagues uh, pointed that very clearly showed that this was not the case. Uh, I think um, just briefly, uh, the team came to the conclusion that although there could be a variety of configurations. Uh, the most likely was probably a northern zone, uh, with France in a slightly ambiguous position given its own lack of competitiveness, uh, but uh, arguing that the so-called peripheral countries were likely to uh, go their separate ways rather than come up with uh, uh, a second uh, a second euro, if I put it that way. Um, the evaluation of default are almost inevitable, um, and uh, this paper proposes that government debt and consumer debt be redenominated using the principle of lex monetae, which some of you may, may or may not be familiar with, but I'm certainly not going to go into the details of it. Um, but how, as a paper also proposed that the corporate sector debt be determined by the courts. That's very brief, brief and doesn't do it justice, justice, justice but it was uh, uh, an excellent paper, uh, and um, if Roger can tolerate this, I'd like him to come up and take what looks remarkable like a brick <laughs> and uh, take award and uh, Getting a glass brick. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the five entrants will also receive £10,000 each uh, when they actually submit the final uh, the nominations on the, by July the 5th. They, they can't actually um, cut up and run that. <laughs> the second um, uh, paper uh, has been put forward by Catherine Dodds, um, who I think rather like uh, Roger uh, called upon quite a number of of people uh, in, in aid and assistance and took advice and, and she wants to give due credit uh, to, to that. Uh, and, and the paper uh, takes a rather different position, I put it this way, on you know, like the economics of EU, uh, which some of us may or not uh, agree with, um, but uh, it probably it does help to uh, remove uh, the suggestion of some French journalists that somehow this is a euro skeptic plot uh, and anybody in favour of uh, the euro is not going to be considered clearly not the case from this. Um, and I, the author was also very sceptical about the practicality of surprise redominant denomination, which was a feature that appeared in some papers, uh, pointing out not unreasonably that in previous in redenominations, the previous currency had in some sense exists, so there clearly, there clearly are, uh, are different differences here. But the thing that really interested the judges here was, was, was less, if you like, the economic background, uh, but um, the, 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 the the focus of this paper on the particular problem of, 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 of breakup, and it was tremendously clearly, clearly written, uh, and uh, at its core uh, was directed to the questions that the Wolfson uh, Prize uh, put forward. 
Um, and the authors really discuss how a conditional on political agreements um, about the ultimate end game for the euro, which, which may be slightly problematic, basically the route for getting there, they look at how it might be best achieved. And the idea um, is original, I certainly hadn't uh, thought of it, but that may not be indicative of better brains than me, um, and it certainly would potentially at least reduce the risk of damaging capital flights, which Neil referred to, and help the legal problem uh, of ongoing contracts um, and the often arbitrary mismatch between successor currencies. Uh, if I may summarise it as, as I understand it, the basic uh, idea stems from the fact that in monetary union, uh, all predecessor currencies were fused into the euro, and on the breakup uh, of the euro, essentially, the idea is to uh, reverse this, uh, this, this process. Um, I have to warn people who haven't read that there is um, uh, a comparison here between using the analogy of eggs, uh, between oak, uh, the, the, the yolk, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the non-yolk bit. And so they refer to the currencies uh, in this terms as parallel, both as Two new euros set up for those, one for the countries that leave and one for the countries that remain in. And uh, they refer to them, it's usually this egg parallel in a rather confused way, in my view, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's ultimately clear uh, between the new euro white, which is called a new currency, and the new euro yoke, which is called a nay currency. You all follow that, have you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and basically, the author recommends that. Uh, uh, that uh, when the uh, currency breaks up, uh, in a sense the euro disappears, so all the holders of euros having their claims replaced by claims on the new currencies according to a, a set proportion, and the authors recommend that the proportion should be broadly in line with the proportions of the new eurozone money stock held by the currencies, uh, currency area. So going back to the egg comparison, just to kind of conclude on this, uh, if an existing country has 30% of the current money stock, assuming the new, the new currency has a one-to-one -one parity with the, the rest uh, on breakout, then every euro will be replaced by 0.3 new and 0.7 uh, of, uh, sorry, 0.3 nay and 0.7 of the new. Now, it sounds more complicated than, than it actually is, and when it's written down and you read it, it is a very clear uh, exposition of, as I say, a rather unique uh, uh, in my view, a way of dealing with these uh, uh, these important internal uh, problems, uh, and uh, to that extent, I think that most of the judges thought it was a, a very elegant proposal. And uh, I'd like uh, Catherine to uh, come and up her uh, advice if she may. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, the third on, on the list uh, is from uh, Jens Novik and uh, Nick Firesi from Nomura Securities, uh, though I gather in private capacity and kind of friend employers here. Uh, and again, the, the macro uh, background is far from uh, what could be determined uh, uh, Eurosceptic. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's, I think, another important uh, illustration of the way we've approached this. Uh, and if anything, it seems to me to underestimate the problems both of Spain and Italy, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and at the heart of the paper was uh, an analysis that really struck a chord with, with the panel. Um, it's very serious in paper, and one of the main concerns about the breakup of the euro is the mess it would cause uh, in ongoing legal contracts, in particular the legal uncertainty and arbitrariness connected with uh, debt contracts denominated in, in euros. So, um, the paper suggests there may be a particular problem in respect of contracts under English law, of which there are, are many. Uh, for the English courts would probably argue, uh, as a matter of public policy, um, given that the euro is, uh, the, 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 the UK is signed up to the EU, uh, that such, uh, in, in, in such decisions, the contracts in English law uh, would uh, still be uh, regarded as be denominated in, in euros. Now, the solution proposed is that contracts falling under national or local law should be re-denominated into the new currency. It's fairly uncontroversial, uh, and that contracts falling under foreign law would be denominated in a kind of AQ2, uh, and that would be a basket of currency made up of notional currency elements of the euro, and the ratio determined according to the country's equity weightings in, in ECB. Uh, the paper also proposes establishing a hedging market, 
uh, in uh, breakup uh, and creating regulatory pressure uh, for financial institutions. I think it's fair to say that uh, the judges were uh, convinced about that. That's one of the reasons we probably ask people to go back as they were about the uh, the, uh, the the central proposal. Uh, and for my uh, point of view, the paper contains some absolutely fascinating tables uh, on sovereign debts and on breakdown of local and foreign court jurisdictions on, on various uh, assets. Uh, and the paper points out that the issue of foreign law debt contracts is, is absolutely critical because there are around 10 trillion such outstanding uh, debts and in some countries, I think Spain and Portugal are the obvious ones, more than 10% of sovereign debt is foreign denominated. So again, a paper that, although it covered a broad, broad range, focused particularly on, a, uh, on, on one particular area, which uh, the judges found very, very stimulating. And so uh, again, I would like um, the winner, if I'm to come up and collect the prize for me. Uh, the next uh, in line now, basically, is, uh, is Neil Record from uh, Record Currency Management. Um, now this paper uh, argues that if any country leaves the, uh, the euro, uh, the entire euro must be, uh, be dissolved. Um, because uh, at the moment one country leaves, uh, the view that somehow the euro is unbreakable um, or permanent becomes completely untenable. Among other things, the paper uh, suggests that the ECB would be closed and its function terminated immediately and uh, functions transferred to the uh, relevant nas uh, national central banks uh, with the ECB's balance sheet shared out on a pro rata basis. So the, the focus on this paper uh, is, I think it's fair to say, administrative, involving uh, an emphasis on maintaining secrecy as long as possible and setting down a detailed week-by-week -week timetable with a process managed by a special task force established by France and in particular Germany. It's quite a, a de regis proposal, if I may put it in that kind of way, uh, and I can see some problems with uh, the, the suggestions that Germany ends up running in this kind of way, but it nonetheless um, did uh, spark a lot of interest in the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the panel. Um, and, uh, the paper explores the management uh, of the, I say, the total euro dissolution uh, and uh, proposing that AQ parities be used to divide up euro obligations. Um, so again, uh, an interesting paper that certainly, from my point of view, is more focused on the economics and the macro side, uh, provided a very interesting insight, uh, as well as covering a lot of the broader ground in, into one, uh, one particular aspect of this, which is clearly very important and clearly uh, one of the items that we drew attention to when we set out what we wanted to do covered. So again, if, if uh, you'll come up and uh, accept this, it's not exactly an Oscar. But... Right. Finally, um, last but not least in all that, uh, is Jonathan uh, Tepper from Bavarian Perception. Um, this was a... Uh, th this was... Uh, very distinctive paper, an excellent paper, uh, in, not only in my views, but the other judges, put forward the case for proceeding uh, to a combined evaluation and default. Uh, it's very clear, uh, it's written in a compelling manner, and um, perhaps unusually uh, for these kind of prizes, it was not only well written, but had a lot of wit and a certain amount of panache, um, not least uh, the readiness to quote various Scatological comments from Lyndon Baines Johnson, which I don't bear repeating, but it was, I think, uh, uh, not one that uh, put people to sleep. So it's very, very good. And though it written in, in a sense, I don't want these to sound pejorative, but written in a sense as an essay, not an academic paper, uh, the use of quotations and the knowledge of the literature was absolutely excellent, and the use of charts and illustrations, uh, very good indeed, and, and was obviously aware of the legal as well as the economic literature and the arguments being put forward by the other, other people. Um, perhaps unusually, the, the, the essay contends that the process of breakup uh, is not especially challenging. Um, points out large numbers of countries have exit currency unions, and uh, typically without significant macroeconomic volatility uh, that's very often associated with exit in, in the country, at least after, after a relatively short period. And the essay argues that the real issues are not created by the exit process per se, but rather by the needs and that motivated the exit 
uh, and that is to say the need for peripheral countries to devalue and default. Uh, the paper concludes and argues that the Eurozone crisis should be regarded in some sense as akin to the emerging market crisis, though there are obviously some specific additional aspects, and contends that currency exits and evaluations uh, have often been predicted to lead to Armageddon, uh, but rather uh, but rarely do. And I think that is one of the one quite important ones because it seems to me, on a different tack, one of the things that's very notable at the moment about this whole this whole crisis is that the extent to which the markets are seeking uh, the, the slightest sign of good news uh, because they're so terrified of um, the alternative, in that put it way. Uh, but as Simon said at the beginning, it's something I absolutely agree with. Uh, having got into this mess, there's no pain this way out of the mess. Uh, but the longer it goes on then the bigger the, da the dangers both economically and financially will be. Anyway, enough from me, and I'd like Jonathan to come up and get his uh, award for me. <laughs> I think I haven't gone on too long, but um, and inevitably they say I haven't really done justice. But if people have got questions, either to me or to the contestants, uh, if I put it that way, um, we'll, we'll be very happy to respond. Uh, though I think we'll try to uh, resist the temptation for each of the entrants to go at length into explaining better than I have the details of the debate. But anyway, thank you very much, and uh, I'm far away if people have got any, any questions. Michael, yeah. uh, this is a great Larry Elliott of the Guardian. This is great optimism that yeah. Larry Elliott of the Guardian has been some optimism in recent weeks that the euro has finally got on top of this crisis that's been rumbling on for the last two, two and a half years. Do any of the uh, five contenders for this price think that the nature of the game or the nature of the challenges has, has, has changed over the last two or three months? No. no. I think the answer is no. I mean, I think, in a sense, the, uh, the recent actions by the, the, cent the central bank I mean, have dealt with a crisis, the name, that is to say the, the problem of, uh, of an imminent credit squeeze, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's only a temporary spot response and, and it's done no more than in the phrase kicking the can down the, uh, down the road and, and it doesn't deal with the problem I mentioned in the context of Roger's paper but was covered by others, that the real difficulty of this, this, this position in Europe uh, is what happens when countries lose competitiveness. And uh, the extent to which these countries have lost competitiveness makes it impossible for recovery inside the eurozone. And that is not uh, not de de dealt with. I think what is interesting about the the latest initiative is clearly uh, the Germans have gone along with it uh, because it is presented, as you like, as an extension of unconventional monetary policy. What the Germans will not tolerate is that it starts switching to uh, some form of fiscal policy. So it's 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 dealt with a crisis. It hasn't dealt with the crisis, and which still remains to be addressed. I don't know whether anybody else wants to. Well, I completely agree with what you said about the importance of competitiveness, but it seems to me the nub of this issue is that uh, you can, of course, try to deal with competitiveness through internal devaluation. That is, the, as I understand, the German suggested answer. But this is a multifaceted problem. And if you deal with the lack of competitiveness that way, you actually worsen the debt problems. This is the critical issue, it seems to me. The only thing which can deal both with competitiveness and the debt problem is the currency to depreciate. And it seems to me that's not recognised or understood on the continent. Yeah. <coughs> to maybe just a very quick remark. So like one way to see whether we really are in better shape now is to see how different bond yields are behaving. And very short term bond yields have been compressed tremendously by this liquidity injection. If you look at very long term bond yields it's completely different. So if you look at what would be the the five-year funding rate in five years' time, you can strip that out from financial markets. In Spain, it's almost as high as it was in November in the middle of the panic. So it's very clear if you look at these long dated instruments, we don't have a common of the situation yet. And I think one way that one has to think about it is uh, the solvency versus liquidity. Um, the ECB has provided unlimited amounts of uh, liquidity, uh, which obviously solves a credit crunch problem, but it doesn't uh, change the underlying solvency problem, which is that um, most of the periphery essentially will not be able to generate enough cash flow to service the debt. Yeah, I mean, I don't know you know, on, on German and Germans, but I think there's, uh, the Germans are being slightly disingenuous, I put it that way. Just, if you look at the way that Germany recovered from its own loss of competitiveness, 
after monetary union, uh, when the West East Germany was taken over by West Germany, the new German economy became relatively uncompetitive. Now, it's quite true that the Germans did do various things on the labour market, um, but actually it was, it was not in a, in a way that, uh, if you like, happened in Britain under Mrs Thatcher, a reform that led to rise in real incomes, but it was just a squeeze on the labour market. But what act, which did help competitors, but the real reason that Germany got out of its difficulties was not anything that Germany did, but that what was a result of the ECB setting very low interest rates, which meant the euro was relatively weak, would help Germany outside Europe. But more importantly, those low interest rates set off inflation in peripheral, peripheral Europe, which increased the competitiveness of Germany's goods, and it went on for a very long time, which set off an asset price bubble, so it increased the demand for those newly German, newly competitive German goods. And, and that was what Germany got Germany out of its problems. And still Germany did not consolidate its budget uh, deficit. It had to go to ECOFIN in 2004 and asked not to be quote unquote fined. And the loss of German competitiveness was much less uh, than those that are being suffered by German countries now. And as Roger said, uh, trying to deal with this by internal deflation is just uh, just self-defeating. Self it's, uh, it's a delusion that was reflected in uh, a, a pretty delusional article in yesterday's uh, Telegraph in an interview with Mr. Tricia. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, which is about um, winners and losers, really? So I was struck by the point that various of the papers made that there's no pain-free way of getting out of the problem. But the distribution of gains and losses, pain, uh, is very different in all of your different papers. I wonder if, in a, in a nutshell, you could encapsulate who are the winners and the losers. It's a very cool question from your different proposals. Oh, sorry. No, it's not really Running around to the extreme um, um, In my proposal, I suggest that um, if you're going to have one exit, you need a total abandonment of the euro, because otherwise you have a nibbling away. You know, once you've established the euro, it's breakable. The market said, OK, so Greece is out. Let's do Portugal. Let's do Spain and so on. Um, and the analysis that I thought quite hard about redenomination, like everybody else here, um, is that generally speaking, the northern banks and northern creditors will be very severely hit. But in the south, it's possible that there will be windfall gains um, on, on the asset base, if you think about the way that their liabilities and assets will go. Uh, and in particular, of course, if you have a an exit and a, 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 a devaluation, then you have enormous increase in competitiveness of the exiting countries. Um, and I use, and I know one or two of the other competitors who use the Argentinian, which is the most recent of these examples, with the collapse of peg and default, and they had tremendously high 6.5% real growth for 10 years, even if it was actually rather a dysfunctional economy. So I think, so I think the winners will be the South if we have um, a, uh, an exit. Well, I think, you know, obviously, this is the big debate about should we have some transfers that keep the euros all together to avoid essentially this uh, potential loss that comes from the uh, the asset mix that northern countries have. So I think that's the kind of subsidy that is currently being considered to keep it together, and that's why the northern countries have an incentive to uh, to pay that subsidy. Potentially, politically, it's very difficult to get uh, a, a, a democracy backing for such a proposal. But that's nevertheless the, the direction we have been edging very, very slowly towards, but probably too slowly to calm things down. But I agree with the general cost-benefit analysis for North and South. Within North and South, the, there are obviously very different groups. There are debtors and creditors. There are. Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists want to say anything about that kind of. Right. Well, the first thing I think to say is that um, in order to decide who the winners and losers are, you've got to establish what the counterfactual is. And this is, I think, a problem throughout the whole debate because you could start from the assumption that the euro is going to carry on, and so you've got a certain distribution of national income, uh, and then you have the devaluation, uh, the event of the euro breakaway, and say, right now, who's better or worse off compared to that prior situation? <laughs> that will give you one set of answers. But in fact, I think analytically, it's the right question to ask in the first place, not the right way to frame it, because the current situation is not that equilibrium. Now take, for instance, the question of default. You might say a country leaves the euro, there's going to be default on its foreign debt, and so the losers from that are going to uh, comprise the group of people who are the creditors of that country that's leaving. But in my view, the current situation is so untenable that the, 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 there's going to be default anyway. So the question is really about what the relative magnitudes are if I can just on this question of and losers, Derek, briefly say something about <coughs> the German position, which is so critical. But I think it's a great temptation to think that Germany is unambiguously going to be worse off than all this. 
And I don't think that's necessarily right. Because what will happen is a significant redistribution and the creation of winners and losers within Germany. If the breakup is wide enough, the new German currency goes up, which means that Germany loses competitiveness. So German export industries are hit by this, although they do have a history, of course, of reacting to others in the past. German consumers, in the direct sense, are unambiguously made better off. The real purchasing power of their incomes goes up. And that is not insignificant because a key feature of the German economy over the last 10 years is there's been hardly any consumption growth at all. So that's, I think, a benefit with the redistribution within Germany. And secondly, related to that, the German authorities can't any longer rely on other people spending money to bring low German unemployment. Suddenly, the German macroeconomic performance deteriorates. The pressure is on for the German authorities to boost domestic demand. So I could argue a case, I think, under which Germany as a whole would actually be better off, and within Germany, German consumers would be a lot better off. I, th I think the simplest way to think about it is uh, to remember what John Stuart Mill said, which is that panics don't destroy capital, they merely reveal the extent to which it's already been destroyed in hopelessly unproductive purposes. <laughs> and so if all the losses already exist, um, the question is, does this happen via a default process, uh, or does it happen via sort of an inflationary process? But in real terms, the, the north of Europe is never going to be paid back the amounts they lent. I mean, it strikes me one of the problems about this is we have the biggest uh, biggest credit boom in, in, in world history, uh, and what happens when boom, credit booms go bust is the creditors get hit. And so far, apart from 100 billion uh, euros in Greece, the creditors haven't actually taken a hit. And it's all a question of uh, who they are ultimately. But anyway, nothing big question there, so. Uh, Sam Fleming from the Times, very simple question. I'll ask each of the nominees to give their view of how long the euro is likely to survive in its current form. Starting from the left, um, the, the question in the paper was how we should handle an exit to maximise future prosperity, and I think we've all tried to answer that. It didn't tell us what we think is going to happen. What I think is going to happen is that we will rumble along in a series of mini crises that look like very large crises, but there's evidently the political will at the centre of the euro system at the moment to continue with this project, in my view, for many years, but it will ultimately end, as Jonathan has said, in a, a, a loss of, of essentially of asset value, which has already been lost, but it's been hidden. Also, I think um, this uh, short-term solution we have put in place by the ECB has a kind of three-year duration to it. So um, there's going to be a big uh, question whether we can kind of rumble along for those three years, whether short-term funding costs will be sufficiently low in that period that it doesn't look like that dynamics is sort of spiraling out of control at a fast pace. But then in three years' time, the ECB will have to decide whether the banking system is actually able to cope with a normal type of funding situation at that point. And uh, probably not. it's not going to be the case that there is sufficient robust at that time, so the ECB will have to face a situation where they're going to roll that operation. In Germany, that's going to be extremely controversial because then it looks like a permanent kind of going money printing exercise. And I think that's the breaking point potentially for, for the system. I think it's um, you know it's an economics question, not a political question, and um, we shouldn't pontificate too much about what will happen. We should just provide the right mechanisms for any possibility, such that things will happen in a smooth and orderly fashion without lots of contracts being renegotiated. You know, I think trying to predict what's going to happen is not part of this. Yeah, I would echo that. We certainly didn't embark on this exercise trying to forecast what was going to happen, and I hope indeed it would be possible for a, someone who was a convinced Europhile to take part in this competition and honestly address the question that was posed. That's to say, for the social person, if I prove to be wrong, uh, what's the best way of sorting out the consequent mess? That's the way in which we approached it. Having said that, my own view is that uh, probably Greece will leave within the not too distant future. And I actually echoing what was said earlier on this morning, I, perhaps it's, I don't know, uh, too vain, I don't know, but I hope that this whole exercise might actually contribute something towards this process. Because at the moment, the prevailing view on the continent is that it simply can't be done. And if you think that the consequences of the breakup of one country leaving are absolutely catastrophic, then of course, 
you will plow on with anything less than a complete catastrophe uh, in remaining in the system. So if it can be demonstrated quite how it could be done without catastrophic consequences, that might actually eventually change matters. But essentially, I, I think what will occur, despite the much vaunted political will, is that both within Germany, within Germany it will be realized how this process is never ending, and there's going to be a bottom of the country with money poured into them uh, without bringing European prosperity. And within vulnerable countries like Greece, it will be recognized that their pain is going on and on and on without any obvious end. I don't know quite which side jumps first, but I think one of them will. I think the euro is fundamentally a political project and not an economic one, and I think it's telling that you have to have a sort of a private sector initiative such as this to explore how the euro might break up, uh, given that politicians are completely incapable of discussing it. So I suspect we'll probably see what we've seen up to now, which is that um, we'll sort of muddle along. Um, I suspect that what will happen is uh, countries that see it in their own benefit to exit will do so, um, so Greece and Portugal. And if you look at uh, unemployment rates in the periphery, you can see that you're dealing with sort of, you know, 40 to 50 percent youth unemployment in uh, countries like Spain. And at a certain stage, people will take to the streets, and I imagine there will be a political pressure, not economic pressure, that will force uh, uh, countries to exit. Uh, uh, when, when it looked like the possibility of Britain entering this, and you're asked uh, when uh, when the euro will break up. I used to like to say we're probably about six months after Britain entered the now central time. Given that doesn't seem to be an option, I think the best answer, to be honest, is one that Mervyn King gave in a slightly different concept. Said, I don't know, you don't know, and nobody knows. So the, the only thing is that uh, the thing is unsustainable that we've got in place a doomsday machine that is not only undermining economies, but undermining democracies. And uh, several countries, including Spain, are already insolvent within the existing system. And it is literally unsustainable, but quite when it breaks and that triggers it. I don't think anybody knows and if it tends they do, they don't. That would be Andrew. In thinking about the process of the Euro breakup, what do you think is the correct way to uh, balance the issue of what mechanisms lead to the highest wealth or the highest and, and the greatest order and those mechanisms that lead to the greatest justice or the least injustice? Yeah, so, so that's actually what we were trying to think very carefully about. Because um, if you're going to have some kind of redenomination, you certainly don't want to have a situation where arbitrary court rulings uh, decide whether one company is going to go bankrupt or the other company. You want to have a system that people can plan and know the system. And uh, that's why we proposed this uh, new EQ arrangement that would be some kind of weighted basket of new currency, so that would be fair in relation to those proportions. And um, it would also be an efficient system, because it would be something that is uh, relatively easy if you have an overall global framework that agrees to this system. You don't have these protracted legal battles that's going to be very costly themselves. So that's kind of exactly the balance we were trying to, to strike with the proposal we put down in the paper. I, 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 I spend a certain amount of time thinking about uncertainty, and I think there's a huge issue about what constitutes a euro once you've had one exit. Because if you've had one country exit, then other countries can exit. And if you have euro contracts, and as we've established, there's a very large amount of euro denominated debt, there's also an even larger amount of euro, euro denominated derivatives, which are country free, they don't have a country allocation. So I think one of the key, the, the key areas that need to, be, need to be thought about now is to create a system of certainty where the players will know when this event happens how their euro-denominated derivatives, assets and debt will be treated. And I think that's extremely difficult. And I, I think the difficulty is if you plan it in public, then it creates the kind of panic that means you have capital flights and I suggested that you need to have secret planning. And in fact a lot of if you look at the history of devaluations and exits and, and and splitting the unions, a lot of it depends on surprise. Otherwise you do have capital flight. Well, I, I mean, justice is a very abstract idea. I think that the, the way, the, the complication is sort of whether something stays in euros or not. But I think that um, the capital structure of firms is such that you know, it's a fairly, fairly clear pecking order. Um, and then the question, though, is you know, whether it's paid back in local currency or not. Um, so I don't think one has to sort of reinvent the wheel with this. I think the difficult question is sort of the re-denomination um, issue. And, and obviously, we've met some of the proposals. 
uh, address the principle of sort of flex money types, whether it's a local contract or a foreign contract. Um, but I, I do think that um, you know, capital structures exist, and there is a way to allocate losses and, and gains. Yeah, I think it will be impossible, actually, to prevent there being a huge amount of injustice, no matter how well this change is done. I'm very struck by the Argentine example, where uh, if someone had a dollar deposit outside of Argentina, then they were perfectly OK. Uh, if they had it with uh, a bank in Argentina in dollars, then they lost whatever percentage of their wealth. There will be all sorts of things that I think are impossible to avoid. Uh, 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 we consider this issue, and obviously we want uh, the arrangements to be as fair as possible. But for me, certainly, the overriding requirement will be macro stability, even at the expense of some injustice. Because the capacity for complete and utter disaster, which would overwhelm everybody, is huge. Now, I draw a parallel here with, well, not disastrous, with the current policy of quantitative easing where very many people have said, you know, and the low interest rates, is it just that all those people who did the right thing and saved are only getting, you know, 0.9% of their money and pensions are getting less, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, it may not be just, but in the wider scheme of things, is that how we should conduct monetary policy? I think the answer is no, we shouldn't. We should have regard to the overall stability and wealth of the economy. And that's how I would approach this question as well. I would say that the capital flow showed the wealthy Europeans in the periphery have already taken the money out of the country. It's already happened. Right, we're just about one time for one more question, and then we'll probably wind up on schedule. Um, Ed Conway from Sky News. I, I just wonder, in this age of uh, Twitter, whether um, each of the panelists could summarise the kind of compelling points. <laughs> 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 140 <laughs> characters or one short sentence. I'm not trying to be infuriating. I, I, well, I'm a little bit. But I also, I need to explain to our viewers in, in half an hour precisely what each of you is, uh, is talking about. So. Can I tweet as we go? <laughs> <laughs> go on. Uh, 140 characters. Um, a German-led task force to prepare in secret a plan for the abandonment of the euro at the first euro exit. Yeah, that one <laughs> In order to uh, avoid a completely disorderly situation around the denomination, it's crucially important that all these different assets and obligations that are outside the eurozone jurisdiction are dealt with in an orderly manner. And that really is key to avoid a huge transition cost in the process. A process basically where every euro is treated equally and um, a process which also prevents the flight of capital and also allows for automatic um, treatment of all contracts that they don't need to be renegotiated on an ad hoc basis. I think that's very important because I think if you get freeze of trade, there's going to create a period of very um, destabilizing uncertainty and corporate. Yeah, I come from the pre-Twitter generation, I'm sure that surprised me. Um, so I thought that of this um, as I'm going along. We want it to be brief. Now, let me say, my... Our submission is all about how, or mainly about how an individual country can lead rather than usually dissolve the, uh, how you dissolve the whole, the whole euro. And on that score, uh, uh, I would say uh, embrace the fall of the currency rather than uh, rather than fear it, it's part of the solution, not the problem. And finally, depending on how brief you want to be, just do it. <laughs> so, uh, currency breakups happen all the time, uh, they're not that bad. Uh, the periphery is already bust, uh, devaluing and uh, exiting and devaluing uh, is the way forward, and not going to grow afterwards. I'm sure we all look forward to seeing how that goes down the sky. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any problems, I can sort it out with Jeff Brown and I get on one of the show as well. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'd like, like... Oh, that's true, yes, no, I'm sorry. The, the other thing I should have, should have mentioned um, in terms of the, the prize, prizes, and we've mentioned a number of, a number of uh, people who've got notable mentions about, in a sense, being supported by uh, the judge of Parliament and the, the award, but we also made uh, another award of uh, £100 worth of uh, toy vouchers. Uh, this is not going to Mr. Trichet or Mr. Von <laughs> Um It's going to a young Dutchman, a little Dutch boy uh, called Herman, what's his name? Jürgen Hermans. Jürgen Hermans, uh, who, who was the youngest entrant. Uh, and he put in uh, um, a, a, 
it took the initiative of putting it in. So we thought it was only fair, um, well not so fair, but it was a rather good idea to give him some award. So in addition to the, the bricks, uh, ten thousand uh, pounds pending and the balance of the prize and July the fourth we've also given toy vouchers uh, to uh, an interesting little Dutch boy who says he's got five friends and plays with them most of the time outside. Anyway, on that note to call end. Um, and uh, and thank you all very much for coming, and particularly the, uh, the winners, quote unquote. Uh, and we look forward to uh, the final prize giving in, uh, in the beginning of July. But thank you all very much for coming, and I appreciate it.